Hello, it's Scott Manley here. I often talk about the mind-boggling distances involved in astronomy with the certainty of somebody giving you directions to the shops. But how do we actually know how far away these astronomical objects are? How did humanity measure the entire universe without ever leaving the Earth? Well, the first astronomical object to be measured technically was the Earth. And that was done over 2,000 years ago by a guy called Aristothenes, who knew that on the summer solstice, the sun was directly overhead in Syene, meaning that it would shine directly down wells. But the sun only reached an elevation of 83 degrees in Alexandria. He knew the distance between these two locations because Alexander the Great wanted everything measured. I mean, he apparently had people in his armies that would march with, around with them and measure the distances to all the places he conquered. So knowing the distance between the two locations and knowing that it covered seven degrees of curvature on the Earth, Aristothenes got measurements which were within one and a half percent of what the real value of the circumference of the Earth. So the next step out is the moon, and that's 400,000 kilometers away. And the first reasonable measurements were made by Hipparchus. That was less than 100 years after Aristothenes measured the Earth. For measuring things in space, the first technique used is parallax. This is the geometric principle where observers in different locations see an object with a slightly different viewpoint. The closer the object is to the viewer, the larger the difference. For the moon observers uh, on two different sides of the Earth, you will see uh, the difference in the moon will be like 1.8 degrees, over three times the angular diameter of the moon. And I used this technique to measure the distance to the moon using photographs taken at two places on the Earth simultaneously with you know, good old fashioned smartphones. But in the ancient world, this was a lot harder, owing to the lack of, constant, of instant communication, clocks, and of course, cameras. Hipparchus used observations of a solar eclipse, and it appeared that he didn't even see this solar eclipse because it was one that happened the year that he was born. In 190 BC, there was a total eclipse over the Mediterranean, and uh, it was 100% total eclipse in Nicaea, where Hipparchus was born, and only 80 to 90% eclipse in Alexandria. So using this, he made uh, a number of calculations of the distance based on these. And the answer that he came up with was about 60 to 70 times the radius of the Earth. Now, these are actually slightly high, but it's still pretty close, considering that he never actually observed the eclipse. The thing is, we don't know for sure which eclipse because his work didn't survive. But 250 years later, Ptolemy discusses Hipparchus in his book The Almagest, a hugely important work in mathematics and astronomy, which was widely copied. But Ptolemy built on uh, Hipparchus' work, and he measured the lunar parallax himself by observing the moon at different times of the night as the Earth's rotation moved the viewpoint relative to the moon. Ptolemy determined the moon to be at a distance of about 60.3 Earth radii, which is pretty much spot on. These days, of course, the distance to the moon can be measured with staggering precision by using retro reflectors left on the moon and bouncing a laser off them. So now the next step out from the moon is figuring out the distances to the sun and the planets. And the parallax of the nearest planets, Mars and Venus, which uh, could be observed on the Earth's surface, was way too small to see with the naked eye. So it would take hundreds and hundreds of years and the invention of the telescope to make this measurement possible. But before that, the geometry of the solar system needed to be solved. And there were lots of people, including Ptolemy, who thought that the planets orbited around the Earth. This was the geocentric model. And then there were those who thought that everything orbited around the Sun, with the exception of the Moon. Once everyone realized that Copernicus was right, and then Kepler formulated his elegant laws of orbital motion in the early 17th century, we had tools to actually measure the distances of the planets to the sun, right? Kepler's laws state that sim a simple relationship between the orbital period of a planet and the radius or semi-major axis of its orbit. So it was then possible to know the distances of all the planets in astronomical units, that is, the distance of the Earth from the sun. So for example, we know that Mars orbits at 1.524 astronomical units and Venus orbits at 0.72 astronomical units. The problem was 
we still didn't know what an astronomical unit actually represented beyond knowing it was the distance between the Sun and the Earth and that it was a lot bigger than the distance between the Earth and the Moon. So the first good answer for the astronomical unit was a collaboration between Giovanni Cassini and John Flamsteed who both observed the parallax of Mars at its opposition in 1672 where it would be much closer to Earth than usual. They worked uh, over many nights observing the location of Mars at different times of the night and finding the small wobble in the apparent position due to the rotation of the Earth. This was moving their point of view back and, day, uh, back and forth over the night. Now, a year later, after, after doing a lot of math, they concluded that one astronomical unit was 87 million miles. And nowadays we know the true value to be more like 93 million. But a decade prior to this, uh, the Scottish mathematician James Gregory had proposed a more accurate method for measuring the distance using timings of the transit of Venus observed in multiple locations. The problem was that the next transit of Venus would be in 1761, over a century later, followed by a second in 1769. But this would be observed and it would be a massive international effort devoted to this, right down to warring navies being ordered to allow safe passage for scientific expeditions. The calculations from these would take a few years, but the result was within 1% of the value that we use today. So now, the next step is the stars, and those are just too far away to show any parallax between pairs of Earth-bound observers. Instead, astronomers would have to use the motion of the Earth around the Sun to provide the difference in the vantage points. Even Tycho Brahe, who believed the geocentric universe, by the way, he tried to measure the parallax of the stars, and, but he, of course, couldn't see it, and he cited the inability to observe stellar parallax as evidence that the Earth didn't move. But yeah, it would be Frederick Bessel who would be the first person to measure a stellar parallax of 61 Cygni in 1838, and he determined that its apparent position varied by 0.314 arc seconds as the Earth moved over one astronomical unit. He therefore concluded that the star must be a distance of 10.4 light years away. The true value is more like 11.4, but this was an excellent measure. Soon after, there would be similar measurements of Vega and Alpha Centauri, but it was a laborious process. By the end of the 19th century, 60 stars had been successfully measured like this, and the introduction of photographic plates made the process much easier, adding hundreds of stars by the 1920s, which was the, next, was the time of the next big step, right? Nowadays, of course, we have the Gaia mission, which has generated and catalogued parallaxes and distance measurements for over 1.4 billion stars. So yeah, 1920, that was the year of the great debate between Heber Curtis and Harlow Shapley. The subject was the nature of the universe, whether the spiral nebula that we saw out there were just small gas clouds or whether they were galaxies like the Milky Way itself. At the time, there was no way to measure the distances on this scale annual parallax based from the Earth was just not up to the task because it would be too small to measure. For distances beyond those where the geometric parallax can be observed, astronomers use what are called standard candles. That is, we know the brightness of an object and we know how it falls off as the inverse square law. So if we know how bright an object is, we know how bright it appears to the observer, therefore we can figure out how far away it must be. So yeah, the real trick is knowing how bright an object is, and you have to find some physical process that will produce a standard brightness. And for that, the astronomers needed to understand stars. And one important step was a guy called Einar uh, Hertzsprung. Yes, the same guy who had the idea for a diagram plotting stars of color versus luminosity. The color luminosity relationship can be calibrated by looking at star clusters, when you know the stars are all roughly the same distance. And then when you look at the variation between luminosity and color, uh, you know, that gives you an idea of how to plot your diagram. Then you have to compare them to close by stars for which you have actual distance measurements. And this gives you a way of connecting the diagram to actual measurements. So this wasn't hugely accurate because there was a lot of natural noise in there. But when you applied, say, these color and luminosity relationship measurements to whole clusters of stars, you can actually get good measurements to star clusters. But that still wasn't enough to cover the distances between galaxies. 
Instead, the really important step was discovered by Henrietta Swan Leavitt. She was working at Harvard under Edward Pickering, and due to the rules of the time, she wasn't actually allowed to look through the telescopes. Instead, she was given photographic plates and asked to catalogue and measure variable stars. A lot of this statistical work was actually done by women, by the way, at the time, even Hertzsprung's work. But anyway, her discovery was a type of variable star which repeated with reliable period. And she noticed that the period of this oscillation, of this outbursting, was dependent on the brightness of the star. Again, since the objects she were, was looking at were all at roughly the same distance in the Magellanic Clouds, the observed brightness was calibrated at roughly the same distance. Now, in a 1912 paper, she introduced a graph which showed this brightness period relationship and noted that if a nearby example of this variable star could be found and its distance determined, that would provide a standard candle for measuring astronomical distances out to nearby galaxies. So soon after publishing this result, similar examples were found in star clusters which had their distances established by the color luminosity relationship providing the necessary calibration. And ultimately, when matching stars were found in other galaxies, their distances could be determined and showed the distance to the galaxy, conclusively proving that the other spiral nebula were in fact far enough away to be galaxies in their own right. So these variable stars are called Cepheid variables because the first one identified in the class was Delta Cephei, which is a 4.5 solar mass star about 900 light years away. Cepheid variables are generally pretty bright stars with luminosities of about 1,000 to 50,000 times that of the sun, even brighter. And the characteristic luminosity curve is how you determine that this is a Cepheid variable rather than something else. Since the only thing that needs to be measured for this is the brightness of the star over time, they're very useful for measuring distances out uh, you know, much further than from where you can use spectroscopic techniques, right, where you need to split the light and measure colours. But with modern equipment, Cepheid variables are useful out to something like 20 to 50 million light years. But beyond that, you need something else. But before we get to that, there was this guy called Edwin Hubble, and he was measuring the spectra of galaxies and using the Doppler shift to determine their radial velocity. By 1929, a small number of galaxies had measurements of their distance and Hubble's measurement of their radial velocity. And when he plotted distance to radial velocity, he saw a trend, which of course demonstrated that the further away a galaxy was, the faster it was moving away from the sun. Now, over time, more data would be collected to confirm this relationship, and it's now considered reliable enough that you can flip things around. Where you have a galaxy and you know its redshift, you can figure out how far away it is based upon its re recession speed. But finally, there's another really important standard candle, which only came into use in the 1990s. Type 1a supernova. These are massively bright stellar explosions, 5 billion times the luminosity of the sun, making them visible in galaxies hundreds of times further away than the humble, humble Cepheid variables. The Type 1a supernova are pretty consistent in the energy released. They start out as a white dwarf star with a regular stellar companion, and the white dwarf is sucking material from its companion, slowly increasing the white dwarf's mass. But white dwarf stars have a maximum mass above which gravity will overcome the electron pressure and cause the star to collapse further. This is known as the Chandrasekhar limit, and it's about 1.4 solar masses. So when white dwarfs reach this mass, they change catastrophically. They don't actually collapse. Just before they collapse, uh, the carbon and oxygen that make up the white dwarfs begin, hide, begin fusion again. And they do this in a very rapid process because the heat can't be released by a pressure or you know, expansion of the thing due to gas pressure. So in a few seconds, white dwarfs burn through almost all of their nuclear fuel and the amount of energy released is enough to unbind the star completely, obliterating it and spreading across the stars. But the fact that this always occurs close to 1.4 solar masses accounts for the consistent brightness of the Type 1a supernova and therefore their use as a standard candle. Now, not all supernova are caused by this mechanism. Some are caused by core collapse, and from millions of light years away, astronomers have to be able to tell the difference. 
One way you do this is by looking at the signature spectral lines. Type 1 supernova don't show hydrogen lines, but they do show, or type 1a specifically show silicon in their spectra. But supernova types can actually also be inferred just by looking at the light curve and how it changes over time. So anyway, this tool gave the ability for astronomers to measure distances of galaxies over like 10 billion years into the past. And this is what was used to measure and characterize the expansion of the universe much more accurately than the simple Hubble constant, which was a linear relationship over distance. This is what they used in the late 1990s to find evidence that the expansion of the universe wasn't slowing down due to gravity as expected, but appeared to be accelerating. So now I want you to realize that we start at the measurement of the distances between the planets and then the stellar parallax falls from that and the CIFID variables and the supernova and all of these measuring tools build on the ones before them. This is what we call the cosmological distance ladder. The idea that each step on the ladder takes you further out but equally each step depends upon the previous one. And there's always new ideas on how to cross calibrate the measurements. There's a lot of techniques that I have skipped over. Half steps on the ladder, which are useful, but perhaps more niche in their application or just good enough for calibration. Every time a new step was found, it made the universe bigger. And while the numbers were hard to comprehend at the time, they were easy to believe because the science worked out. Now, I experienced uh, this sort of uncertainty when I saw the first suggestions that the expansion of the universe was accelerating. That didn't make sense to me because I'd done astronomy in the 80s and early 90s. I expected, you know, for a long time after this result came out, I was expecting new studies and new data to show that something had been missed and the universe expansion wasn't actually accelerating. But now 25 years on, it does look like dark energy is here to stay, at least until we come up with a more descriptive name for it. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.